Yeah, I'll ask uh, Mr. Innocent Mvamba to please step up to the stage. Mr. Eli Boggy, step up to the stage. Ms. Rosemary Chengula, step up to the stage. Ms. Caroline Tuebaze, please step up to the stage. And Mr. Eric Kivera. Okay, so I'm going to assume the position of a senior geologist. So if I ask you something that you do not understand, you are free to correct me. But um, right here, ladies and gentlemen, we have Mr. Innocent Vamba. He's a paleontological investigation. Uh, he's a paleontological investigator of the Ayasi Wembere Rift Basins. Um, he's going to be talking about the paleontological investigations of the Ayasi Wembere Rift Basins and the implications and analysis and interpretations of the hydro, uh, hydrocarbon potential. And then we'll also have Mr. Eli Bogi talking about the integrated geophysical survey of Soleil Gas Prospect in Nakuru County, Kenya. And Ms. Rosemary Changula will be talking about the reviewed petroleum system of the Rukwa Rift, ba uh, Rift Basin, implication to the hydrocarbon uh, prospectivity. Ms. Carol Tuebaze will be presenting on the re-evaluation of Field X located in northern Lake Alban, uh, Albert Basin to refine the structural imp uh, interpretation. And finally, Mr. Eric Kivera will be talking about Tanzania's offshore interest for future oil and gas reserves. So we'll start off with Mr. Innocent Vamba. I hope I pronounced your name right. Yes. Okay. So presentations, please. Yeah, good afternoon, everybody. In this afternoon, I'm going to present a study on panological investigation of AS Wembere Basin, implication for panofascist analysis and the environmental interpretation for hydrocarbon potential. I'm Innocent Mvamba, panologist T TPDC. Before I proceed, let me make two or three words clear. When we talk about panology here, is the branch of geoscience that deal with the study of all palimonovs. And when we talk about all palimonovs, they include the organic world microfossil that are pollen, spore, dinoflagellate, that are useful in biostatigraphic dating, environment interpretation, and maturation study. And when I talk about environment, this is a past environment. And the term palimonofascist here were applied by all, all total organic matter that is recovered from panological preparation that are resistant to acid maceration. My presentation, I will introduce the study site and the objective, whereby I'll go to material and methodology, panological result obtaining, which include palinostatigraphy, panofascist and the paloenvironmental interpretation, sediment maturity, and I will conclude and the way forward. Introduction of the study site. The Easwembere Basin is located in the northeast of Tanzania along the eastern arm of the East African Rift System and is essentially divided into three sub-basins after the AGG data in 2016. We have the Manonga, Wembere, and the Eyasi sub-basins. TPDC has conducted several studies within the region geological mapping, surface geological mapping, and they realize that we have scarcity of outcrops. Therefore, only few outcrops that were found in the region were not good or were not give us the detailed petroleum system within the region. 
we find that we have some lake bed sea and we have some loose compacted sand and mbuga soil within the region. Therefore, we decided to drill at least one borehole within each sub-basin so that we can get the undersurface geology that will give us the sediment package geology, geochemical and biostratigraphy, and the petroleum system within the region. Therefore, we drilled the first borehole in Kininginila, second one in Wembere, and the third one in Yas. In Kininginila, we call it, it is in Manonga, Sabezin, in Wembere, it is Luono, Borehole, and in Easi, it is Nyalanja Borehole. Therefore, the objective of my study was to describe and the identification of all polymonos, as I told you, they are inorganic old microfossil yeah, that are useful for dating and the application for adocarbon potential. And then we conducted biostratigraphic analysis to develop biozonation in order to know where the key marker species so that you can date the sediment. And then we conduct palynofascist analysis in order to know the paleoenvironmental deposition and then finally we determine the thermal maturity of the sediment by using spore color index. These are the material methodology. A material divided into three segments. First of all, we have sampling procedures. Second, we have laboratory analogical process, and the third, you will have to make analysis, interpretation, and you have to document. That's included the microscopic work. Therefore, we had 43 core samples from Kininginilawani, Nyalanjawani, and the Lonoani boreholes. Therefore, as you see, we use the, the, their core sample. We sample them systematically according to the depth. We sample the lithology according to the lithology that includes silty, clay, and sometimes muddy stone. Where we have sand, we didn't sample because there is no preservation of organic matter and polymonos. Then we use hydrochloric acid, HF, HCLO maceration process in the laboratory, whereby this process ensure that you remove all carbonate and silicate material, and then you make decantation. After that, you collect a residue for heavy mineral separation, then you collect your residue ready for slide preparation by mounting. Then you have that one, this, that is the microscope, then you can visual and photograph and make analysis. Therefore, we use to determine, the edge was used to determine by comparing those who were recovered by using pollen and spore from those recovered from Gondwana land. In the polynofast analysis, we counted 200 pieces of organic matter depending on the organic richness by using transmitted light microscope and the maturation study, it is spore color index. Now, this was the result. This is palynostatigraphy result. That's simply the application of palynology in stratigraphic. As you see, the Kininglanwani borehole from the left side, we have very few and almost barren of palymonos. We discovered that we have only two index species here. That is Ephedripsi, Stagratis, and we have Taurite minor. This species were long ranging, therefore we didn't use them to define the edge. If you, see, if you move right, you'll find that you have amorphous organic matter, but the right one, you'll have high abundance of fungal spore, as indicated below. The two species indicated that is by socket pollen and acacia were used to define. Therefore, if you see the general distribution, if you go to Nyalanja, we have like almost well distribution of polymonos and well preserved, but in Luono, we have high recovery of phytoplasty material. By stratigraphic comparison, you will find that in Kininglawani, we have high abundance of fungal spore that tell you that this environment were deposited in a hot and wet climate condition, while in the other boreholes, we find that there is a high abundance of amorphous organic matter that will give later in a paleoenvironmental interpretation and if other phytoclast material. Next slide. This is palynofascist and paleoenvironmental interpretation. You see well preserved organic material. If you, we divided the organic, organic material into three categories. 
we have structures, organic material, that is woody remains, so wood debris, we have well preserved brown wood, black wood, their relative abundance will tell you the deposition environment, and at the right we have well preserved plant cell and brown wood and plant cuticle. At the bottom, we have amorphous organic matter, which is an indicative of the low deposition environment and the anoxic environment. This material also can be used to characterize, yes, yes, I'm just finishing, to characterize to characterize the deposition environment and also kerogen typing. Maturity of the sediment, we use spore color index to determine the mature, maturity of the sediment and the most recovered spore are ranging from brown to yellow in color and that is marginal maturity. In conclusion, the geology of West Wembere Basin is the mirror image of Lokicha and Albert and Graben where we have a high, we have a commercial discovery of oil. Therefore, there are, we have the possibility of discovering hydrocarbon I, because the material we obtain there, they show that there is possibility of the source rock. Therefore, this high abundance of, of amorphous organic matter and the aquatic algae is an indicative of kerogen type 2, which are mostly capable of producing oily upon maturity. Therefore, encouraging more paleological and the other geological study within the region that the aggressive should be emphasized so that you can discover oil. Thank you. Thank you very much. The next presentation is going to be led by Good afternoon. I know this is not the best time when people have eaten. It becomes you don't know whether you are alone or you have or they are with you. So uh, uh, my name is Eli Ogimulumbu. I'm from Kenya and uh, I want to present to you the integrated geophysical survey of Solai gas prospect in Akuru County within Kenya. Okay. Uh, one of the things, imagine you are a farmer and uh, you are so interested in seeking for what? So you have identified a place you want to drill for what? In the process of you drilling water, uh, when you think that you are almost at the point of striking water, there is a gush of gas coming out of the borehole. What do you do? You'd be very excited, perhaps I have found a gas or uh, perhaps you may be disappointed or you may be happy. This is what has happened in some of the areas in the Kenyan Treasury Rift Basin. In one of those areas, uh, the first one being in Kipeto and the other one, which is this study is about Isolai, were able to obtain, there was gas that was found when a farmer was drilling uh, for water. And in the process of doing that, he struck gas and it flared. They wanted to know which kind of gas, so it flared and it, uh, it burned for a while and it ended. But in other places, we find that the gas persists for a very long time. So those cases, we can be able, there are areas we can be able to establish the source of gas. In other cases, the flow has persisted and therefore dispelling the, the hypothesis of biogenic origin, just, just being one of the origin of uh, gases. 
So this investigation was carried out to ascertain the cause or the pathways where this gas is coming from in, in, in Solai. The objective was to establish gas pathways in Solai region and to determine structural controls that have influenced the existence of this gas. A specific objective is to was carry out magnetic and gravity surveys to find the ground, underground fracture system or regime guiding the movement and distribution of the gas. The study area is Solai and Sinakuru County. It's about uh, uh, 30 kilometers from Nakuru, capital of Nakuru County. At the northern side, there's a lake, Solai, which is about 16 kilometers. And then there's the southern side, or southern western side, there's a Menengai a volcano. This is within the tertiary rift basin, and this area is also being explored for oil and gas. The regional geology, we can see that the whole area, we have tufts, we have lacoste train and alluvial deposits. The area lies within the Mangai volcanics. This area has also different kinds of rocks, as you can see from the diagram. So I'm not going to those details. We we'll just move ahead. And this, in carrying out a survey, we did using gravity and magnetics, and we used the gravity to obtain a gravity data, and also used a magnetic survey equipment called, called CISHAM, vapor magnetometer, to be able to collect magnetic data, and this was processed so that we can be able to determine uh, the faults and fractures. Okay. Uh, uh, from the diagram, we can see it's, I think there's a mis uh, mishap, a small mishap. Okay, uh, the, we can see from the diagram, there is a, a defined structure where, where the, the arrow, uh, the black dot is, that's where the borehole was found. And you can see the magnetic anomaly and the my residual. They are almost, they are similar. And the, behind, around it, that is low magnetic anomaly, which, could, which implies the existence of fractures because between high and low magnetic anomaly, those are uh, points where the fracture zones are. The TMA residual, it's able to even define it clearly. You can be able to see that from the eastern side, there is a fault on the uh, north-south and also going towards the north. Uh, if we look at the gravity anomaly and gravi uh, the residual gravity, you can also see that the point is also being defined there. The uh, tilt derivative, it even defines the structure clear because it's between a high and a low. It's like a host. So when this farmer was able to drill at that point, he was able to obtain the gravity, uh, he was able to strike water. So that host is within a fracture that is surrounded. So the water, the gas could have moved within uh, around the region and therefore trapped within that particular structure. And then when he struck, he was able to get look at the magnetic derivative. Those are the magnetic Miller solution for, for the area. Uh, when you lay them down, I think they, uh, you find that around there, we can, the till the derivative steals on, on the Euler solution shows that this, that point 
is within, the fault is within that particular uh, region, and this is the one that helps in. Uh, I'm almost done, thank you. Then finally, we can see that Euler solution uh, in this case reveals the pathways that control the flow of the gas. And this gas is thought to have moved and tra been, been trapped as a pocket in the area by developer while drilling for water. So in this case, we need to do further geological and geophysical investigation. The actual the main aim is to find where it's coming from. So further, when we do further the physical and uh, geological, we can be able to determine where it's coming and possible find the basin where this cousin gas is head migrated from so that we can be able to use it, trap it as a resource for development. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, my name is Rosemary Chengula. I am geophysicist working for Petroleum Upstream Regulatory Authority. So I welcome you all to my presentation. Okay. So welcome to my presentation titled Reviewed Petroleum System Elements of Rukwa Rift Basin Implication on Hydrocarbon Prospectivity. Um, to begin with, my presentation has several parts. Has several parts. Uh, well, we will see the description of the study area, the geology and stratigraphy, uh, and we also have a chance to explore about petroleum system elements. And finally, we'll come into a conclusion of my study. Uh, the objective of this study was mainly to review the petroleum system elements uh, so that to provide a guiding tool for further exploration which will be done in the basin. And the methodology used uh, was mainly to review the technical reports, uh, the published papers and uh, other published information. So to begin with, uh, Rukwa Rift Basin, as you can see there on the map, it is located in uh, the southwest Tanzania and uh, as you can see on the left, it is bordered by the Tanzanian Craton on the northeast and also by the Lupa Fault, if you can follow the map. But also it is bordered by Ofipa Plateau on the southwest, uh, but also by the Mbozi Block uh, and Runga Volcanic Province on the south. Now, this basin has a sediment uh, thickness to about 11 kilometer thick. Uh, and it has been divided into two blocks. We have uh, North Rukwa and South Rukwa. And the good thing is that both blocks are open for exploration. And we have uh, a package of data, including the seismic data, the magnetic data, and we have also the uh, gravity data. So to start with the geology and the stratigraphy. Rukwa Rift Basin evolved uh, as the strike uh, to oblique slip uh, pull apart basin and uh, this is uh, revealed due to the numerous faults which are trending uh, north, uh, northwest. Uh, if you recall the previous map which I projected, it shows uh, several faults uh, orient uh, in the north uh, to northwest uh, direction. These are strike slip faults. So this is the orientation of uh, the fault in the Rukwa Rift Basin. And uh, the tectonic uh, activities in the Rukwa Basin are recorded in the major three timing. Uh, we have the first, the oldest one, which is the Pemo Triassic rifting, and this led to the deposition of uh, Karu Supergroup. And followed by the overlaying uh, Cretaceous Oligocene rifting event, this uh, led to the deposition of the Red Sandstone Group. And uh, in to on the top, we have, uh, uh, we have modern rifting, which uh, is associated with the East African rift system, and this led to the deposition of the lake beds. So we can say that, in summary, the stratigraphy of Rukwa Basin has a uh, group, uh, the basal part, which overlies the metamorphic uh, 
metamorphic basement rocks, and it is then the Karoo supergroup is overlain by the red sandstone group, which is further divided into Nsungwe and the Galula formation. And then on top, we have the lake beds. And if you can see on the right part, we have a seismic section, which shows they have grab and geometry of the Rukwa Rift Basin and the three mega sequence, which I mentioned to you before. So jumping to the petroleum system elements, um, starting with the source. Rukwa Rift Basin uh, records to have a very good source, uh, and especially in the lake beds, we have type 1 kerogen, and uh, the TOC ranges up to 2.5. And as we all agree that this TOC range uh, uh, assures that there is good generating potential for hydrocarbons. Uh, and also, these uh, results were obtained from the Ivunawan well. And now, this well is not located at the depot center, so it is proposed that probably going towards the depot center, the maturation of the source rock would increase. Then, coming to the reservoirs, um, the good thing is that. All the mega sequence in the Rukwa Rift Basin have characteristic, source, I mean, characteristic reservoir rocks starting from the Bazo Karu to the top lake beds. But among the three, the lake beds prove to have uh, the best uh, reservoir rocks because they have uh, good porosity uh, up to 40%, as we can see, and their good permeability uh, compared to the rest uh, two mega sequence. Because the rest uh, have shown to have some extent of clay unlike the, uh, the reservoir rocks found in the lake beds. Then coming to the seal, uh, the original seal in the Rukwa Rift Basin is the shells. However, in some, in, some, in some part, especially in the lake beds, there are faults which also act as the seal. So they, 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 they seal the hydrocarbons. Now, coming to summarize what I've been pre presenting, you can see on the left part, we have a summary of the three uh, 3D positional mega sequence with the petroleum elements, petroleum system elements. And among the three, uh, the lake beds, the top one, uh, proves to have uh, a very good pot potential for hosting hydrocarbon because it has a very good source. As I explained before, the one which has type 1 kerogen and TOC of about 2.5%, uh, and, and also it has reservoirs rocks, uh, which have good porosity and permeability, but as well it has a good seals. So, we can say that the lake beds could be the good potential for exploring more about uh, hydrocarbons. But uh, the, general, uh, the general comment uh, from my review is that most studies have uh, successfully uh, explained about the petroleum system elements, though there is little, uh, little studies which have explained about the petroleum system processes. As, okay. So, such as migration and trapping mechanisms. So, uh, I recommend that further studies uh, and uh, exploration to dedicate much in filling this gap. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, as my presentation is being uploaded, I am called Caroline Trewaze. I am a geoscientist currently working at Petroleum Authority of Uganda. Uh, thank you. Yeah, I'm Caroline Trewaze, a geoscientist currently working at the Petroleum Authority of Uganda. Yes, I will be giving a presentation about re evaluation of a field to basically to refine its structure interpretation. And my presentation is going to flow. Uh, my, presentation, my presentation is going to flow as follows. I'm going to have an introduction where I'll give you the aim of why I did this study, the methodology I used to undertake the study, and I'll also give a brief overview of the East African Rift system basically the structure setting, and then I'll also give uh, some of the quality control procedures we undertake before we go into the interpretation. Then I'll give the results and uh, analysis, and then I'll also give an, an implication of the work on government, of, on government, and then I'll conclude. 
Uh, basically, evaluation means, um, you know, looking at the data set that has already been uh, interpreted the second time, like you're giving it a second look. And the uh, main objective for this particular study was to, uh, to, to, to refine the structural interpretation of that field to understand its geometry. You'll agree with me that uh, in oil and gas upstream projects, once you, you understand, you get your structure right, uh, it gives you a um, good way with geological modeling, then into resource estimation, and then you'll have a superior planning for your, the development of your field. Uh, the, um, uh, the particular field I'm talking about uh, had uh, data of about 40 square kilometer of seismic data and well data from three wells, including both well logs, VSPs, check shots, uh, formation tops. And then how, how did I look at this? I did a standard process of interpretation and then also looked at the you know, new technologies of uh, uh, using extracting attributes on the seismic data to be able to to be able to bring out what uh, the properties that had rather been subtle. Uh, just to give a brief overview of the East African Rift System, uh, this is a continental rift zone that is uh, still active now. Uh, it runs all the way from the Afa Triple Junction in, in Ethiopia and then goes through East Africa up to, uh, to Mozambique. It also spreads along the coast of Mozambique. And then uh, it's uh, divided into, okay, the major branches of the East African Rift System. We have the Western Branch and the Eastern Branch. Uh, our Albertine Graben of Uganda belongs to the Western Branch of the East African Rift System. When you look at the, at the middle map, uh, it shows you the, the extract of the Albertine Graben. And you can clearly see that uh, along its, le its length, it's very highly faulted. Um, and uh, of course, it's also associated with main rift basins. Um, then when you look on the, on the extreme right, the upper, the upper schematic, the geological section just taken along the, the East African rift, the, the, the graben, the, the Ugandan graben. And then the lower uh, picture on the right is the seismic section that is taken across, across the graben. You will appreciate that all these are associated with uh, numerous faulting, or these are studies that have been done by um, our colleagues. Uh, some of them will work with them in the Portarium Authority of Uganda, uh, including uh, Director Abino Mujisha. Um, yes, before you do any interpretation in geophysics, it's, it's very important to scan through your data to understand some of the basic, uh, some of the basic properties of your data set like frequency. So this picture on the right, on the left, the seismic data, I'm showing you how um, we scan through the data to extract a, a, a frequency spectrum where we understood how our data looks like, how the resolution we are dealing with, and what we can be able to get from this kind of data set. And then on the right, of course, also understanding the polarity of your data set is very, very vital. Um, uh, in any inter geophysical studies, as long as you have well data and seismic data, you must go through a process called seismic to well type because you're dealing with data, well data in depth, and then you're dealing with seismic data in time. So you must have a way of correlating those two data sets so that you'll be able to, to interpret them together. So this is a process, and this is a, uh, an on-lap of the time-depth relationship showing you how... Um, the, the, the relationship was undertaken, and uh, that is the analysis. After doing the seismic query tie, you again map it on your seismic, and then take arbitrary lines to ensure that uh, uh, your correlation has been done effectively. Um, then into uh, what I majorly did, so basically I used, uh, I extracted so many attributes on my data set, and for the purpose of this presentation, the variance attribute was mostly handy. It's a, it's, a, it's a good edge method attribute, and it is good at imaging the, the, the structure, the discontinuity in seismic data. So you can be able to get out the faults that you could not get 
if you have not extracted these attributes. Uh, when you look at the, um, the topmost picture on the, on the left, it shows you a variance attribute map, and you can clearly look where the variance is highly pronounced um, as a, con as a, a discontinuity. So those were picked out as faults. And then the middle map shows you the, the extraction of uh, a time slice at some level, about 2,100 milliseconds, um, to bring out the, the, the faults that we're able to see in the variance attribute. Then the last, yes, basically here what I did is uh, I, we managed, I managed to extract faults that had not been interpreted before. And then the below maps are showing the interpretation of the previous work that had been done and then the work that I was able to do. So I was able to get three other additional faults in the interpretation, and this is very good uh, to define the geometry of the field. Um, just to give a brief implication of the data interpretation on government, um, one, you'll agree with me that uh, as government, we work with, uh, with the IOCs, but by all means, we'd want the, the, the capacity of the of the government people reach the level of the IOCs or even more because you're going to interrogate the IOCs work. So by all means, if we continue doing these um, data interpretations, looking at our data sets, we shall build the capacity of the technical people so that they are able to um, look at the IOCs work with, uh, with good uh, basis, with a uh, good basis. And then, um, I, I actually, if I can refer to the earlier session that had took place in the morning, the managing director from uh, uh, Zambia, Zanzibar um, Regulatory Agency uh, emphasized or highlighted the, the need for uh, strengthening the, cap the capacity of the regulators so that they can be able to implement, um, to help the, the companies implement or be compliant uh, with the, the, regula the regulation. The regulation. Um, another thing, uh, well, uh, also in the oil and gas, we always have uh, professionals at all levels. We have uh, researchers, we have students, we have uh, internship students. So by all means, when you're doing this work, we are kind of doing a lot of knowledge transfer and enabling continuity uh, in the oil and gas industry. Um, if I can conclude, in conclusion, the attributes were, were able to, to help me identify the structures very well, and also um, for effective data interpretation, it's good to explore very many methods so that you can pick out the method that fits the data. Every data is unique in its own way, and uh, I would recommend uh, that this work that has been done can be um, exploited more by you know, going ahead and looking at those faults, if they are sealing the properties of those faults, so that you can be able to, con to contribute to the superior planning of the field. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ms. Bonner. Final comments? Final comments? Final comments? Final comments? Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Eric Kivera. And on behalf of Mr. Kevin Komba, I'll present for you Tanzania Offshore Interest for Future Gas Reserve. I've, uh, I'll go through some brief information on exploration history of offshore and onshore of Tanzania. Then I'll give you some information also on data acquired in offshore area, hydrocarbon system and pre-concept. Then I'll give you some information on gas discovery in Tanzania, also some potential future areas for gas discovery and conclusion and recommendation. So uh, exploration history in Tanzania is dated back in 1950, and mostly uh, at that time activities was mostly in coastal areas, and uh, later uh, some Companies that's BG and Shell were concentrated mainly on coastal area and uh, islands that's Pemba and Unguja. But uh, for, the, for our case now, because we are trying to concentrate on offshore part, uh, exploration activity in offshore they came on around 2009 to 2000 and 
2016, where we had a lot of campaign around 2010 to 2014 and discovered a lot of gas in block 1 to end 4. Uh, in offshore part also we have enough modern data uh, in for example for to do seismic data we have uh, regional data which we acquired around 2006 to 2013 uh, this has covered much part of the offshore area and we also have uh, 3d data which we are acquired in some different blocks by the operators and also we have um, uh, more than 16 drilled wells, which uh, has been successful uh, at a rate of 93% in some of the offshore part. So I'll go through also uh, hydrocarbon system and preconcept in offshore area in brief. Uh, offshore area has source rock potential, which has been identified, and we have uh, Triassic, uh, shells which are more deeply buried and uh, they are also considered gas flown and uh, we have lower to mid jurassic sediments that's shells which are also considered gas flown and this is the main uh, source lock which is widespread and this is it is considered to feeding most of our reservoir in offshore Tanzania. Also, we have post to mid Jurassic Cretaceous and Paleogene to Neogene uh, source rocks. Uh, in terms of uh, migration, offshore Tanzania, mostly migration is vertically and, uh, and uh, is uh, the, the red stage invasion related force have been indicated to act as a migration conduit uh, in offshore part. So, and in for the case of the reservoir, we mostly have crustic sediments and uh, mostly are closely related to post rift uh, reservoir, uh, post rift sediments, which are closely related to input sediment points. That's our delta, and we are estimating to have like 15 sediments input from the rivers. And we have also presence of post lift reservoirs which have close relation with the sediment inputs from the rivers and uh, we have closely related uh, uh, sediments distribution from the rift depot center during the late Paleocene to early Miocene. Uh, offshore Tanzania especially the southern part of the of the of Tanzania we have a good discovery of gas and uh, from the map you can see we have uh, those like four blocks there. We have block one, two, three, and four. We have, uh, we have discovered a lot of gas in that area. With, uh, we have drilled more than 16 wells with a success rate of 93%, 93% and discovered like 70, 47 TCF. So the area look potential with that data and seeing it bordering Mozambique where they have discovered more than 100 TCF by drilling 19 wells with, two, with only two wells that are not e economic. So you can see the area considered very potential for hydrocarbon exploration, especially gas. So although we are considering this area very potential, but we still have some blocks which are underexplored. If you can see, most of the activities which have been done in this area, they are concentrated in the, as you can see, the, ro the red, uh, the red uh, polygons there, those are the area which most of the activities has been conducted. So east of that area means we have very few informations and we haven't conducted much. So we are considering this area very potential. Then if so, we think now it's a time now to think uh, on this block. I've mentioned some of the blocks that are very near to where we, we have discovered gas in block one, two, three, and four, and also they are very near to the Mozambique gas discovery. So we think uh, these targets can be our future for gas discovery, 
and considering the fact that the globe now is on transition to clean energy and the uh, Ukraine war, which we now see the scarcity of energy in the globe. So by conclusion, I can say, uh, based on the available data in offshore Tanzania, we are having still more blocks to explore, especially the eastern side of the WF fracture zone, eastern of the block one, two, three, and four, which there are more potential. They are very near to where we have discovered a lot of gas. Then it's time now to go and explore. Uh, some can say it may be because it's deeper, but we have seen Mozambique uh, now uh, have floating LNG, then why not Tanzania? So we can still have floating LNG and we can export using the opportunity now that energy is scarce. So thank you. Everything seems prone to gas, because all, all the findings are gas. I just want to understand, is it, um, is it an issue of uh, kerogen type, or is it a maturity or over maturity issue? Just to understand, thank you. Uh, yes, uh, as I've shown, we have some, we have identified some resources. And most of the gas which we have discovered is from the emitted Jurassic system, which uh, based on the studies, like uh, the Miocene invasion has caused the gas to fail from the system and the reports Oh, okay. Please. Can we have the microphone? We are cognizant of the time. We have our last panel, and we have to travel across town, and we need to do that thank, fast. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, I just want to add what uh, Kivera has just said. Kivera has just explained the, the coastal part of Tanzania, what we have, why we have gas more than oil gas more than oil, but Tanzania is very potential. As right now we have just opened the rift system which we believe will have good uh, oil kerogen so we are working towards the rift system in Yasu and Berry and in Lake Rukwa also you've seen the presentation from, from the lady from uh, Pura and also we have Mandawa which is oil prone areas. So as you speak, Tanzania, yes, we will discover gas. 
with what we have, but we believe we have oil somewhere and where is where we are going. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, 15 seconds now because our time has been eaten. <laughs> From you, sir. Yeah, thank you very much, moderator. My study was focusing on panological investigation in Yasuembere. And all of us, we know that Yasuembere is the frontier block or basin that is as the same geological analog with Lokicha and the Albert and Graben, where we have discovery of huge commercial crude oil. Now, this area, by having the same potential of exploration, we can, I can say that uh, the data you obtain, they do correlate with the AGI data in Yalanja area. Therefore, we encourage more study, especially conducting 2D seismic, because the area, if you go to AGYs, has got Just more than one million seconds, years. So it's potential for hydrocarbon. Thank you. Thank you very much, Innocent. Uh, we we'll go to Rosemary. Thank you, the moderator. Um, as my study was uh, dedicated to Rukwa Rift Basin, and Rukwa Rift Basin, uh, if you compare, it, it has uh, almost the same characteristic with the Albert Basin in the Uganda. So, and as I presented, it has complete petroleum system, so it showed that there is a good potential for having hydrocarbon. So uh, we welcome uh, more exploration to be done so that we can prove that. Thank you very much. Carol? Thank you, moderator. My study was basically looking at uh, an interpretation, reinterpreting the data set. So, uh, and as you saw, as you saw, it's, uh, it was able to show me some structures that were not able to, to be interpreted by the IOC. So, uh, my parting remarks is that uh, I encourage the, 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 the government to invest in uh, independent uh, evaluations by the, the staff of the government so that we'll be able to have an effective uh, regulation of the oil and gas companies. Thank you, Caroline. Uh, uh, Eric? Yes. Okay. Uh, my talk was mainly on the offshore part of Tanzania as the future for more gas. So based on the available information and discovery made in the southern part of offshore Tanzania, we think we still need more activities, especially on the eastern side of the WF fracture zone. So we encourage more investment. TPDC has block, block 4 and B, 1 C, which is doing its activities. More investment is needed. So anyone interested, you're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. And finally, Ellie. Uh, I think mine is to Uh, looking at the studies that have been done, I think uh, we have studies in the rift and we have studies in the offshore. Some of our countries uh, share borders and these bases cut across. I think we encourage the integration and sharing of information. I think the East African community has to bring out policies that we can share uh, various information in terms of geological history, whatever the studies that are being done in the rift and as well as in the offshore, even as in Kenya we are expecting to have uh, exploring for gas in the offshore because the Lamo Basin is mature. So I think we as a, as a East African community, going it alone may not be the solution. And I think with the government putting in place and setting up institutions, we can be able to capacity build and share uh, and work together because these resources that you are working in the individually as a, as a team and through a unity, we can be able to exploit them 
for the benefit of the East African community. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eli. Thank you very much, everyone who has gone through or listened to this panel speak. A round of applause for our amazing panel. So we'll just stand and have a photo moment. So those cameras are going to focus on you. I think I see Kenneth has transformed, <laughs> which is great. <laughs> okay, so um, okay. Um, my name is Beno Sangoli, um, exploration geologist, exploration manager from Tanzania Petroleum Development Corporation, TPDC, National Oil Company of Tanzania. Um, here to, to do the moderating on behalf of my director, Mr. Kenneth Mutonga who is busy working on something else back in the office. Ladies and gentlemen, as we, we are waiting for our presenter to come, please let me, allow me to welcome all of you by introducing National Oil Company of Tanzania. As Kivera explained, we are doing exploration. It's the National Oil Company of Tanzania taking um, business side of upstream, midstream, and downstream in oil and gas exploration in Tanzania. We have two subsidiary. One is dealing with gas distribution and processing. The other one deals with oil importation. TPDC has more than 400 geoscientists, business people, we are doing better in Tanzania. And as TPDC, we have blocks. We are looking for partners. We have 41B, 41C, as Eric mentioned. We have AS Wembere, which is in the rift system, and we believe has a very good geology, similar and analog to what you guys have here in Uganda, like Albertine. And we believe it's where we're going to hit our first barrel of oil. Inshallah, God is there. And we have West Songo Songo. West Songo Songo is next to Songo Songo producing field, the main one, where we're producing more than 130 amps cup of gas per day. We're popping to Dar Islam for power generation and industrial use and home base use. We have We have Mnaz Bay North. Mnaz Bay North is sitting next to Mnaz Bay main producing field where we produce more than 110 m scuff of gas per day. In total, Tanzania, we're producing more than 230 m scuff of gas per day. 
and we have uh, Lake Tanganyika, which is another good area for oil prom. So we believe with what we are going on and exploration, we will hit oil one of these good days. So ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Tanzania. As we continue waiting for the presenter to come from the different area, our session is on sedimentary basin, the heart of oil and gas exploration areas. So we believe we're going to have a very exciting time with people from different areas in East Africa. Please allow me to call uh, Simon Kimario if he's around, please. Jeremy in front here. Mr. Emmanuel Mwesiga. If you're already here, please come in front. Mr. Lucas M. McLean Hart Godson, please. If you're here, already here, welcome in front. Miss Fiona. Miss Fiona, if you're here, please. And we have our sister Rachel A. Sabun from Pura. You are welcome. I guess we are still waiting for Miss Fiona. You're Rachel. Rachel. Thank you. Uh, they are all here, so we are, we're going to go to our, to our session. It's called the Best Practice Exploration Sedimentary Basin. Ladies and gentlemen, my rapporteur will be Dr. Shahid Nuru Shaban from TPDC. Shahid Nuru. All right. Thank you. It's all right. So, well, we are given another five minutes. Petroleum Authority of Uganda, creating lasting value in Uganda's oil journey. Government and its partners are supporting the development of linkages between the oil and gas sector and other sectors of the economy, including agriculture, transport, education, housing and land, use, planning and tourism. Studies have shown that every $1 of GDP point directly invested in the oil and gas sector will yield of the GDP by $0.6. The oil and gas sector in Uganda is therefore expected to yield indirect growth of the GDP by $8.5 billion, 24% by the time the first oil is achieved. The linkage between the oil and gas sector and one of the most important sectors in our country, agriculture. The oil and gas industry does not consume a lot of food, but at least it consumes high quality food. So if Ugandan farmers are able to provide the quality required in the oil company camps, it would mean that they have attained international level qualities. The idea at the incubator point uh, run by, by Stambik Bank and, and its partners, um, it actually feeds into the idea which we are trying to do as government. How do you get the people who are out of the economy, who are comfortable, uh, doing things the way they are doing them, the agriculture, uh, which is based on gifts of nature, 
um, the failure to adopt very uh, friendly technologies to improve yield. For more information, visit www.pau.go.ug. Petroleum Authority of Uganda, creating lasting value in Uganda's oil journey. The Oil and Gas Moment, brought to you by Petroleum Authority of Uganda, creating lasting value in Uganda's oil journey. The oil and gas activities in Uganda are expected to create about 160,000 new jobs. Close to 70% of these jobs will require technicians with international certification. Basically what we're doing here is we're working with industry whereby after our candidates have been trained in the workshop space, we send them to industry where they now get to apply so that they confirm a competency level. We uh, were given opportunity by government of Uganda to train students under the Albertine Bursary Scheme project, about 690. They have done the audits. We'll have uh, uh, 60 uh, trainees under Sino. We are also working with our partner Solid Rock to execute a similar training for Total. Uh, and, and that is for 4F and 5F uh, welding as well. Following the announcement of the final investment decision in February 2022, work on the oil and gas projects has intensified. 94% of the 5,000 employees already engaged in these projects are Ugandans. The National Oil and Gas Talent Register provides visibility to Ugandans with skills and competencies for possible employment in the oil and gas sector. I'm called Kiyomuendo Jole, aged 26. To the experience I have gained, I could encourage my fellow ladies also to do what? To join technical courses because as a female welder, you can't fail to get a, a job. Everywhere you go, they will admire you and look for you. Registration on the National Oil and Gas Talent Register is free. Visit www.pau.go.ug to register. Petroleum Authority of Uganda, creating lasting value in Uganda's oil journey. The oil and gas moment. The oil and Welcome again to our session. Please, um, we'll have uh, five people from different areas, from Tanzania, Kenya, and Uganda. They will do the presentation on sedimentary basin. First of all, let me call uh, Mr. Lucas. Mr. Lucas is the, is the chief geologist from DRG Global Company, has a bachelor degree in applied geoscience from Queensland University, so has, he has 13 years experience. And uh, Mr. Lucas will present on integrated uh, geochemical, geophysical understanding of Albertine Graben. Please give hands to Mr. Lucas. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Mr. Lucas is not available, but we shall. My name is Kato Badia Anthony, senior geologist from the Petroleum Authority and uh, I will present on this topic on his behalf. Um, just waiting for, for the slides. So generally my presentation, we shall look at the study area. We shall then have a look at the geochemical exploration theory and technique. Then look at the geochemical and geophysical data acquisition and analysis. Then we look at the work streams where this data has been integrated. And then we look at the conclusion. So basically, that red circle that you see there in the map is the Kanyuatava contract area, which covers about 344 square kilometers. It's operated by AMA Energy Uganda Limited. A number of studies have been conducted to date, such as basin modeling, surface soil geochemical surveys, reprocess existing 2D seismic data, amplitude versus offset studies, Acquired and we also acquired and processed 163.4 line kilometer of 2D seismic data. 
and also the company undertook a prospectivity study. So what is the theory here? What you're looking at is a, a seepage model. That illustration shows you the hydrocarbons, that's the dark, uh, the black zone, and it shows you bubbles of uh, the hydrocarbons making their way to the surface. So this particular technique of geochemical exploration uh, identifies any geochemical anomaly that happens at the surface. And this is also evident when you look at seismic sections where we have vertical gas chimneys coming from the subsurface where hydrocarbons are accumulated. And uh, we end up getting what they call acoustic signal attenuation expressed through the seismic sections. So um, the main formula that you see there is that uh, this technique relies on the presence of iodine, which has a unique property and an excellent choice for geochemical exploration surveys. It's in the atmosphere and it reacts readily with hydrocarbons. So the volatile hydrocarbons combine with the iodine, changing the gases into iodo hydrocarbon solids. And these are the compounds that can be used to track hydrocarbon seepage at the surface. These two maps, when you look at the map on, on, on the extreme right, uh, you see the geochemical survey that was conducted in 2019 in the KCA, and this involved uh, acquiring 308 soil samples from, the, from that block, which were taken for laboratory analysis. And these soil samples are gotten at a depth of about 0 0.5, what you would call the horizon B in the, in the subsurface, and can be acquired by hand augering techniques in the field. What you see on the extreme left is the, so, uh, the seismic acquisition that was done in 2021, and also soil samples were picked at all the short points during this seismic survey. And the same data processing that was done in 2019 was also extended to the surface, uh, to the soil samples that were acquired in 2021. What you see here is the results. Now I want you to look at the colors. Let's focus on the one on the extreme right behind me. And that one shows you the 2019 results. Where you see dark blue, those are very low concentrations of iodine. Whereas as we come down that key, you see the colors become brighter and that shows you an increase in the, in the, in the concentration of iodine um, uh, compounds. But now when we go to the extreme left, that is the same study that I just projected uh, of 2021 when uh, they have also integrated the same approach to the seismic short, short uh, points where the soil samples were picked. And again, you will see that the bright colors show you a high concentration of iodine. Moving on, the company went ahead to uh, get this kind of technique and apply it in their basin modeling, where they were able to identify petroleum plays for the KCA. Uh, their primary targets being in the Miocene play and the secondary being in the Pliocene play. The same um, uh, technique was also used to identify deep in inversion structures mapped on the hanging wall of this fault system. As you will see, there are some, uh, you have the hanging wall there and you have the interjumba, um, malimbe, the crane, and all these are structures that were identified as the company conducted uh, seismic surveys. Going ahead, the company also uh, implemented low frequency seismic anomalies approach to their data. And mainly because uh, in the Albertine Graben, uh, they have used these low frequency seismic anomalies to identify accumulations of hydrocarbons in the subsurface. And this too was uh, utilized in the studies. Going ahead, as you can see, um, when they superimposed the geochemical data uh, outputs onto the prospect uh, in the block, you could see that there was uh, uh, the iodine anomalies and coincident low frequency anomalies are found to occur towards the north of the deeper section of the Kanyuataba block, which is associated with a fault system. On your extreme uh, left is a list of the two prospects and uh, there are also three leads. So just to make it clear, prospects have a higher degree of confidence that you may encounter hydrocarbons when they are drilled as compared to leads because of the amount of data it shows towards the existence of hydrocarbons in the subsurface. 
So as we speak, the company has identified two prospects. In terms of uh, the conclusion of these observations, it shows that the low frequency anomalies in the seismic amplitude have been linked to the presence of hydrocarbons in the subsurface and can provide a reliable indication of the potential location of oil and gas deposits. Number two, iodine geochemistry has emerged as a promising tool for exploring oil and gas resources. The presence of hydrocarbons in the subsurface can cause a significant increase in the concentration of iodine in the surface soils. The integration of these low frequency anomalies and the iodine geochemistry method can provide additional data that can help to improve the accuracy of exploration programs and reduce risks associated with drilling dry wells. A key advantage of having more than one technique is that it can help to resolve some of the limitations associated with each technique when used in isolation. In conclusion, the company is now currently working a multi-well drilling program in the Kanyua Tower contract area that is based on, this understand on these findings. And that brings me to the end of my presentation. I thank you very much. Will be Mr. Simon Kimario, is a geophysicist, 10 years experience from Tanzania Petroleum Development Corporation, he holds a master's in geophysics from Leeds University. Simon, we're going to present an integrated interpretation of potential field 2D seismic data to study hydrocarbon potential of West Songo Songo block. Simon, you have uh, seven minutes, please. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Simon. I'm from Tanzania. I'm working with TPDC and expression geophysics. I'm going to present a presentation regarding integrating interpretation of potential field data and the 2D seismic data to, to study hydrocarbon potential of West Hong Kong Song of Block. My presentation outline, I will start the introduction, objective, methodology, and workflows. Data interpretation results, summary of hydrocarbon perspectivity, and then I will comment, I will conclude with recommendation and way forward. On block location, the block is located in, in the southern part of Tanzania, in the western part of Songo Songo gas field, in the coastal basin of Tanzania. And the block is currently operated by TPDC. The surface area of the block is about 505.6 square kilometer, and the water depth range from zero to 100 meters. And also there are present infrastructures that are nearby the, the block, we have a gas processing plants that can process up to 140 m scuff per day. And also we have a pipeline that extends from Tuara to Dar es Salaam. And also we have another pipeline, which is a marine one of about 25 kilometer, 24 inch, which run from the Songo Songo gas field to Somangafungu. Somangafungu is a place where the two pipeline meets. Also in this block, have the available information that we use for GNG studies. We have uh, magnetic and uh, gravity data, and also we have airborne gravity gradometric data, that is HG, acquired by TPDC in 2015. And also we have a sparse 2D seismic data that extend from the gas field to the West Songo Songo block. And uh, the line is about 240 line kilometer, and also the deep line is about one to two, the spacing is about one to two kilometer and the strike is up. It's range from one to four kilometer. And also we have offset well data from the adjacent blocks and many of the blocks that we use for this study is from the gas field. I have two objectives. The first one is to conduct quantitative interpretation of potential fields that will enable to estimate depth the basement, temperature, and sediment maturity. And also, I will apply the, I applied the seismic data to identify the potential structures and the potential, potential areas for exploration. And for the methodology I use, 
uh, I start with the literature review and then I apply the potential field data. Here I use magnetic data and I do some interpretation, depth the basement, and then at depth the basement I do two approaches, EULAD convolution and the power spectrum analysis. And then I use the result to obtain from power spectrum analysis of the magnetic data to estimate depth temperature at shallow depths and to complement on maturity of the sediments. Further on the seismic, uh, I did some well time to get the well information and the well that I use here is about 10 kilometers from the block and is located in uh, Songosongo gas field and is the deepest well in the block in the gas field which is a Songosongo one. Two minutes please. Okay. And uh, then I do some false interpretation horizon and I do some attribute from the seismic lines. And I integrate the tools us from the potential seismic and the comment on the hydrocarbon prospect. And this is a result from obtained from the magnetic data is from EULA deconvolution approach and it shows that the results stretch from 4.5 to up to 6 kilometers. And this one is a result from the potential field data, which is magnetic, from the power spectrum analysis approach. And the, the results shows that the sediment range from 3 kilometers up to 6. And the two methods give some consistent approximations, because the EULA is about 4.5 to 6, and this one is 3 up to 6 kilometers. Further, I use the, the depths obtained from power spectrum analysis and apply that equation, that follow equation, which can be used to estimate the temperature at shallow depths. And most of the data I use from heat flow website and applied in that equation, as you see on the slide. And then I managed to estimate the temperature of the, at that depth range from 117 to 212 Celsius at a depth range from 3 kilometers to 6 kilometers. And for the seismic data, this information was extrapolated from SS1 well and extrapolated the block and identified the key horizons. And here I'm showing the, the top Nicomian, which is the main reservoir in the, in the gas field. And the top left map, the left map shows the structure, contour map from the Nicomian, which is the main reservoir. And there are two potential structures, structure closures, the one I marked number one and another one with number two. Also, to, I picked a few lines that cross the potential. I did some seismic attributes, the RMS, which shows the high amplitude areas, which is, shows the possibility of having hydrocarbon. Also, there are some di direct hydrocarbon and uh, DHIs, as shown in the right, right diagram on the, on the slide. 30 seconds. OK. And summary, segment thickness range from 3 to 6, which is uh, enough for hydrocarbon generation. Maturity is from. 117 up to 200 Celsius and thermal gradient about 30 plus or minus 2 Celsius per kilometer. And the results was compared to the values we have in SS1 and they show a consistent result. Also based on the as per literature, this range is with, lies within a gas window. As we know, the gas window range from above from 60 to 120 oil window from 130 to 200 for gas window. So this range lies within the gas window. Also managed to identify two potential areas and also we have a working petroleum systems, source, reservoir, trap, and seal. Lastly, on future work and way forward, TPDC, as I as mentioned earlier, that the block is current work by TPDC. We are looking for strategic partner 
that we can work together in acquisition, processing, and interpretation of 3D seismic data, and then drilling of expression well, appraisal well, and data development and production depend on the amount of programs that will be discovered in the blog. Thanks. Also, I thank TPDC and PURA for granting permission to present this presentation. Thanks. Thank you very much, Simon. Thank you very much, Simon. Uh, our next speaker will be Mr. Emmanuel. Mr. Emmanuel Mwisiga will present on optimization of low quality 3D seismic data acquisition parameters using the computational method of reacquisition of seismic data in the field X in, in Albertine Graben in Uganda. Uh, Mr. Emmanuel is a geophysicist production at PAU has a master's in petroleum geoscience from Makerere University. Emmanuel, we are welcome. We have your seven minutes, please. Thank you. Thank you very much, moderator. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. As we wait for the presentation, yeah, they've already formed you. I'm going to present a study on the optimization of the 3D seismic Okay. Yeah, 3D seismic uh, data acquisition parameters using the computational methods of seismic data in the Albert and Graben. Uh, this is an ongoing study. So basically, I will discuss, uh, I will discuss mainly on a case study and then also the work which has so far been done. Okay, as an introduction, I uh, you know we are limited with a slight number of slides, so I wouldn't go for the first slide that is going to show an outline. But as the introduction, hope everyone can see very well. We are having the Lake Albert on the map. As you can see, unfortunately, this is another slide. Final copy two. Sorry, this is a different presentation. Final copy two, final copy two. Yeah, but as he looks for the presentation, basically we are going to look at the Lake Albert. We know very well Lake Albert is training from uh, northeast to southwest. So we're going to look at the different sets of data which were acquired uh, within the southern part of the Lake Albert. We shall see that we have two vintages which were, different vintages were acquired. We have the 2D and the 3D seismic data. As they work on the presentation, you'll be able to follow up. But one thing you're going to see is that these data sets, uh, or the data was acquired, the 3D was acquired in the same year. But we are going to, first of all, see the quality of the data deteriorating as we move from the northern part to the southern part. Then we have also the 2D seismic data which was acquired. And we see that in the northern part, you'll observe that we have a good data quality, but we wonder why as we come to the south, our quality of the data starts deteriorating. So basically, the study is trying to find out what was the problem. Was it because of the parameters of acquisition which were used? Was it because of the technology? And then also we shall look at the case study and see for the recent technologies which have worked and the areas which are almost similar to some of the area we are having now, uh, what kind of uh, method did they use? And Okay, thank you very much. So basically, that is the slide. You're seeing uh, in the blue color, we have the 2D seismic data which was acquired in 2005. And then we have, uh, in the green color, we have the, uh, another data which was acquired in 2007. I'll also mainly now round up with, uh, in the purple color, purple, that is 2007. If you look at it critically, you will see that we have uh, 2D, 3D sets, one up 
and then another one down. There is a certain point where the three D data sets merge. So those vintages, once they merge, we shall see that at a certain point where they merge, starting from around that point, the quality of the data is okay. But as we come down, we see that the data quality changes. So basically, we see that the pencil is covered with those several vintages, and we have some wells which are already drilled, the exploration wells. Actually, there are over 10, uh, including the side tracks. But you'll see that during the exploration, uh, minutes, some please. of, during the exploration, so many challenges uh, were faced by the drillers. They had a lot of losses. Reason being, they didn't know very well uh, what was in the subsurface. They didn't understand the real structures. So we find that during the exploration phase, they had to uh, make the side tracks because of the so many losses uh, due to some faults which were there. So uh, some of the challenges we have in this seismic data, the data has got a low signal to noise ratio, insufficient lateral resolution, and then uh, we have also a poor stratum of the imaging. Poor stratum imaging. Now, what's the aim of this study? It's to optimize the low quality seismic data, as we've seen, using the computational methods for, for the reacquisition. So, basically, we are looking at a possibility. If the data is poor, do you think we can go on to process? And this data has been processed quite a number of times, over four, five times. But we find that uh, between 2012 to 2016, all the processing techniques could not work. So now, the option would be, is there a possibility of reacquisition? And if we are to reacquire this data, what went wrong? that we need to find out. So when we look at the quality, as I say, if you look at the map, the upper section, when you look at the quality of the data, we see that we can easily even uh, pick our horizons very well if you, as you come to the south. On my, this is my right, I think on the screen is your left. Two so minutes, on your left and on left. my right. Okay, let me use this, my right. This is my right. As you come from the right coming down, we see the deterioration of the quality of the data. Look at the frequency band. The frequency band width is very narrow. It will affect our resolution, both the lateral and uh, uh, the vertical resolution. And then you look at the low amplitudes around where there is that uh, oval shape. As we come to this side, in the south, we see that the data is really the data quality is not good enough. So uh, if you try also to look at the downer section, at the extreme upper part, that is in the north, we see that at least the quality is okay. But as we come to the real south end, we have that chaos data. So basically that is what we want to investigate and then see whether we can get a solution for it. So the specific objectives basically now is uh, I'll be constructing a 3D subsurface model. Why do, we, why do I need a subsurface model? Uh, if, we get, uh, if we get an area of complex geology or uh, very hard structures to understand in terms of seismic data, we always prefer to model first of all, our subsurface, and understand what it is. Yes, if we have an understandable geology, it's okay. After carrying on your 2D, we can straight away go to the 3D. But if we have some expression wells, and we've got some uh, 2D data, dense 2D data, it's advisable that at least we first model. What is the advantage of carrying out a model, knowing the subsurface? you will at least predict and you know what area do you really need to place your sources, if it's land, where do you need to put to your receivers, and it's going also to reduce on the cost of the equipment you are going to use. Because this model will give you a picture of the subsurface. And as we model, 
you'll be able to know where really which receivers, uh, which uh, sources are going to play a role in the illumination of your target layer. So if you come to know the number of sources and the receivers, and then you can also get the parameters using uh, this method we're going to use. One so, minute left, one minute left. Okay, let me be a bit fast. Uh, so those are the objectives. I will not go so much in them, but we need to construct a 3D subsurface model that is the use. And now I'll be able to generate the illumination maps, the synthetic seismic shot gathers, and optimize the survey design. Now, if my synthetic, uh, my synthetic seismic shot gathers give me a good prediction, then at the same time, I'll use the illumination map to simply know what kind of uh, receiver lines, what kind of uh, uh, source, uh, source lines, intervals I'm going to use, and then other parameters. So I will not go so much into this of the methodology because the time is really not enough, but I just made a workflow. Uh, and we have NOSA and SCTQ softwares. These are the softwares which I'm planning to use. Uh, you see, we have an elastic earth model. That is simply a demonstration of how the model can be. But also, I prefer to use a, I may use, I will use a velocity model for this test to know how fast my seismic waves will travel to the surface and then come back. So what I'll need also is to design a preliminary survey, then uh, take them through the forward modeling. What I'll do is simply to get uh, the generated theoretical seismic waves and they will propagate through the model, come back on surface. Yeah, this is computational method, but it's basically more of modeling. Uh, come back at the surface and then using that method, it will be able to give me the illumination map and I'll clearly know that on this target layer, this is where we can see, this is where we can uh, probably have our energy reach or know the areas where the energy will be absorbed and will not reach the surface. So by that, now I will be able to do the optimization. Just within one minute, allow me to talk about this case study. Yeah, according to Fata et al., this is one of the most complex uh, geophysical challenging areas in the world. So this, uh, this study, if you have time, you can find out, and then it's about a uh, survey design and illumination study for complex geology in the Gulf of Mexico. You find that in this area, Neptune, in, uh, Neptune took over this block in 2019, and there was already an existing data which was acquired in 1992 with a lot of challenges which you can see. And this area has had already uh, production going on with the gas and oil fields. It was a very busy area, the shipping lane, but we find out that 3D was able to be acquired. And at the end, I will not go through the methodology, I've given uh, a brief about that, the velocity model. But what happened is that the preliminary results showed a great improvement in the data compared to the data which they had in 1992. So, in conclusion, if we look at the cost of the development uh, 3D seismic acquisition costs, it may range from 10 million to 200 million if it's offshore. But modeling only can cost between 20 to 200K. So as a good practice for the exploration in our sedimentary basins, I would really encourage why don't we do the modeling and have an idea instead of us going wrong and then we think of coming back and waste money. At the same time, also, uh, we find that the time is not enough for us to cope up with the ongoing operations. And then two, uh, the optimized survey design uh, can provide a good 3D seismic baseline survey for the 4D seismic acquisition. Assuming we're going to do uh, 4D and say no. Me, I'm going to drill. Let me drill and I know what is happening. Then maybe I'll process uh, the data which we have and then later on, I'll use that data to do a uh, 4D seismic. What if our process data does not tie with our wells? We need a baseline survey coming to 4D. Shall we come back and get the baseline? So doing it right at the first time will be the best thing. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Manuel. Our next speaker is Ms. Fiona, Ms. Fiona Etiang from Ministry of Energy and Petroleum of Kenya. She's a petroleum geologist with nine years with nine years experience. She'll be presenting on hydrocarbon potential within the onshore land basin in Kenya. Fiona, welcome. You have now six minutes. Thank you so much. Um, as we're waiting for the presentation to load up, uh, my name is Fiona, and uh, uh, we co-authored this with my colleague called Eugene Omenia. So I'm presenting on, so I'll be presenting uh, on his behalf as well. So basically, we are looking at the hydrocarbon potential within the Kenyan onshore Lamu Basin, and. Uh, so we, we decided to address uh, two objectives, and uh, this was to um, understand the geological history, and, and for this we basically uh, decided to focus on the sediment deposition. And uh, our second objective was to understand the, the rock units in the, in the basin that have the potential for accumulation of uh, hydrocarbon. And so for our methodology, we decided to, to uh, incorporate our recent geological field uh, investigations in some of the blocks. Uh, these are block, blocks L16, L17, L19, which, uh, which lie uh, within the on, uh, onshore section of Lamu Basin. And then also we decided to look into secondary data, and these are the available data um, in, the, uh, in the internet and anywhere, anywhere we could get. So this uh, shows uh, the evolution of the basin. And so the Lamu Basin formed as a passive margin, and uh, it formed during the Karoo rifting, during the breakup of the Gondwana spur continent. And so the Lamu Basin lies on the southeast uh, section of, the Kenya, of Kenya, and so that, uh, that's on your extreme right section. And so if you notice, the onshore, uh, the Lamu Basin uh, lies both onshore and offshore, but for our study, we decided to focus on the onshore uh, part of it. And so we are interested in this because we've heard of uh, recent discoveries uh, in our neighboring countries, such as Tanzania, Mozambique, and uh, we decided to, to, do, to, to research more and see what Kenya has in store. Uh, uh, considering what we are seeing in the other countries. So, so these are photos to show you some of the outcrops we have encountered in the field. So uh, I'll start on the extreme, on, the, on, the, on your right, which is my left. So I'll go in a clockwise direction. So on the extreme right is a uh, limestone. Uh, that has an expo we, we encountered exposures of more than 100 meters. And then following closely, that's a shell outcrop that we found in a quarry. And then moving on, uh, where you're seeing um, a person in blue, that's uh, those at the top is a sandstone, and then in the middle is an outcrop of a shell, and at the bottom is a sandstone. On the extreme uh, right, that's a sandstone outcrop. Then going down, we have a limestone, and closing up, we have the Campbell limestone. So generally, we have a good representation of the sedimentary rocks, and this is just an example of what we, we find in the basin. So basically, the geology of the basin consists of the carbonates, shells, limestone, and marine sandstones, and uh, the Lamu Basin has potential source rocks ranging from type three to type four corrigin, kerogen, sorry. And um, we have a, not about abundance shell sequences that 
uh, good potential uh, uh, ceiling rocks and also source rocks. So this is a summary of the uh, stratigraphy of the basin. And so I'll start uh, from the bottom going up because uh, if you know geology, the, the rocks at the bottom always present the oldest that were deposited. And so at the bottom we have the, the Karoo group and uh, this is dated to be Palmo-Triassic all the way to Jurassic, so that's roughly 250 to 145 million years. And uh, there's been evidence of plant fossils and fish life, uh, particularly in the Madia Chumvi formation, which is a potential source rock. And then we also have uh, the Taru grits and the Mazera sandstone, which uh, are reservoir rocks. So what's interesting about the, also the Chumvi formation is that it has, uh, it's a fine sandstone that has uh, interbeddings with, with shells. And then also still in the Karu group, we have uh, Kambe limestone and the Rare limestone, which I showed earlier. And these are uh, the potential reservoir rocks in the area. And then moving on um, up the, the image, sorry, the image, on the, the image on the extreme right. So the second uh, group is the Sabaki group. And that is uh, Cretaceous uh, in age. It dates, uh, it's, uh, it's 145 to 65 million years. And uh, most of the wells that have been drilled in this area have, uh, have uh, tried to penetrate into this group. And so we have wells such as uh, Dodori, uh, the Kofia one. We, we have the... Uh, Two minutes left. Pandagua and the likes. So from the wells that were drilled in this area, we've had uh, gas shows. We've had uh, slight oil shows, but we haven't had any significant discovery. And then going up, we have up the, the column, we have the Turner group, which is uh, Paleocene to Eocene, and this is uh, 65, 68 million years to 45. And the outstanding units in this um, group uh, is the barren beds formation, and this is uh, sandstone. And, and then we also have uh, the limestones, the, uh, the blue color, and uh, the Simba shells, which are in orange. So going up, uh, we have the coastal group. This is the uh, uh, dates from Miocene to recent. And in this group, we get the limestone, the Lamu reefs, and um, the outcrops such as uh, Marafa sandstone. So, on the extreme, uh, uh, the other diagram shows uh, an example of well, well stratigraphy uh, for, the, for the Kipini well that was drilled. And as you can notice, it follows more or less the same sequence as uh, the diagram that we've just uh, gone through. So in conclusion, uh, the petroleum system in the Lamu Basin is well advanced, and uh, we, have all, we have the necessary elements for the petroleum system. We have the reservoir rocks uh, that did uh, Jurassic and Cretaceous and all the way to Pamo Triassic. We have the traps, uh, which are block faulted structures, radio fault traps, stratigraphic pinch outs, and for the seals, we have the shales and the evaporites. So then what is it, uh, what's in it for the, gov uh, for the government and the business opportunity? So the government uh, has an enabling policy framework and uh, when companies come to carry out exploration, uh, there are times when they are given exemptions on certain items that uh, are to be used in the exploration. We also have a supportive legal environment. We have the constitution that protects private property. And then we also have uh, Petroleum Act, 
that was uh, that have been in effect since 2019. And currently, we are in the process of drafting upstream petroleum regulations. So in the hope that uh, uh, the potential investors who want to work in Kenya will have a, a clear framework on how to go about it. And then now for the business opportunity, uh, in the Lamo area, we have uh, actually we have established physical infrastructure. We have uh, airports. Uh, we have extensive road networks. Uh, we have a deep sea as our deep sea port uh, that can handle bulky goods that are involved in the exploration. And then currently we have uh, open petroleum blocks which are available for investment. Kenya has a total of 63 blocks and currently we have 51 available. Particularly in the Lamu Basin, we have, uh, in the Lamu onshore, we have around 16 basins. Uh, then this also presents an opportunity for companies that offer services uh, in the oil and gas. And then also Kenya has a well, a well educated human resource that will be uh, very substantial for for anyone who, need, who wants to, to do any work there. Then strategically, we've been a gateway to Af East Africa, so we have many um, opportunities in place. So that's all I had. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yona. Um, our last speaker will be Ms. Rachel A. Sabuni. Ms. Rachel is a PhD student from University of Dar es Salaam. She's the assistant lec lecturer at University of Dar es Salaam Department of Geology. This afternoon, she will present on petroleum system and hydrocarbon potential of Ruvuma Basin in Tanzania. Rachel, you have seven minutes, please. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Rachel from University of Dar es Salaam, and I will take you through petroleum systems and hydrocarbon potential of the Ruvuma Basin. So as I said, I will take you through petroleum systems and hydrocarbon potential of the Ruma Basin. I'm sorry for that because they didn't have my presentation yet. Um, you might be wondering why Ruma Basin. Ruma Basin is found in southern side of Tanzania in western shore of Indian Ocean. This is the basin that extends up to Mozambique. And recently, 
This basin have discovered abundant gas, closing to 250 TCF. And out of it, 200 in Mozambique side and an estimate of 50 TCF in the Tanzanian side. So the question is, we have abundant gas in Ruvuma Basin. Where is it all coming from? While well, we are not even aware of the source lock potentiality of the Ruvuma Basin. If you look at most drilled wells that were drilled earlier, it shows that uh, Ruvuma Basin has potential intervals, which were the Pemo Triassic, Jurassic, and Cretaceous. So, apart from knowing that we have these potential intervals, but yet we don't know the hydrocarbon generation potentiality of this interval. Are we sure that um, gas is what was generated or something else was generated and converted to a gas? So to be able to answer all these questions, uh, petroleum systems were evaluated, including the hydrocarbon generation. Before the source work potentiality of the Ruvuma Basin used to be inferred from the nearby basin which are the Morondava Basin in Madagascar and Mandawa Basin, which is the north of uh, Ruvuma Basin. As a result, uh, an extension area for exploration was very hard to target, including selection of drilling site. Were very hard because now we are not even aware if we have oil or it was our oil converted to gas. So as a result, uh, the sample were selected from um, one of the well which touches the Pemo Triassic, Jurassic and Cretaceous interval, and that was Lucled one well. And then from there, sample were screened for geochemical analysis, where I assessed for organic matter richness, I assessed for maturity, and I, I assessed for kerogen type. Maturity most of the time is what tell us if the temperature was favorable for hydrocarbon to be generated. Richness tell us if we have organic matter for hydrocarbon to be generated. And kerogen type tells us whether we are gas prone or oil prone. And for the petroleum system, what I did is I reviewed some of the seismic section, coupled with well data to be able to establish how many petroleum systems exist in Rovoma Basin. So from, from the analysis, I was able to identify that the Paymount Triassic interval was the richest interval in the basin, with TOC of about 75%. Then if you, you check on the results on the generation potential, the Pemotrasic interval showed to have the highest generation potential. And then when you check on the kerogen type, it shows that the Pemotrasic interval of the Ruvuma basin were oil prone. Then, I assessed again on the Jurassic interval, which shows to have a moderate richness, moderate generation potential, and it showed to be gas prone. The assessment of the Cretaceous interval showed that the source work were immature, also gas prone, but incapable of generating anything by the time, based on maturity, because they were immature. So the assessment again, the petroleum systems, showed to have a four different system existing. Let me remind you, petroleum system means you have all the petroleum element in system like source rock, reservoir, migration pathway, seal and trap. So you have them as the separate compartments. So I was able to identify four different petroleum systems. The one in Cretaceous, no, the one in Cenozoic, which is the youngest, as you could see with the brown cycle, well, the blue cycle where the Nazi Vegas field was found. Then another one was um, Cretaceous play system, which is where the Antolia gas field was found. And the rest were the Jurassic and uh, Pemotriassic play. You may be asking yourself that we have Pemotriassic, Jurassic, and Cretaceous and the Cenozoic play systems, but it's only the Cretaceous and the Cenozoic system that's where the hydrocarbons were found. I'll answer to that later. So based on the conclusion of hydrocarbon generation potential, the uh, Ruvuma basin showing to be higher, to have higher potentiality of early generation and not gas as what we are finding. Because if you look at the Jurassic, it has gas potential, but it's less as compared to the Pemotriassic. So this tells us that we need more research 
uh, and find him, uh, um, the location where this oil could have been accumulated, such as uh, following migration pathways uh, in the source rock towards the reservoirs, so as to be able to pinpoint where these accumulations might have been left out. So apart from that, as I said, why we have uh, only hydrocarbon in Cenozoic uh, place systems and Cretaceous place system? The answer goes back to evolution models or time event charts map. We all know that during Cenozoic, which was accompanied by East Africa rifting systems, uh, breached most of the reservoirs in the coast of East Africa, including this reservoir with older age like Pemo Triassic and Jurassic. That's why if you come to most of these um, uh, reservoirs in uh, Ruvuma Basin, you will find it's only in younger reservoir, you only find abundant gas. And not in deeper sources, because so far we have not encountered a reservoir in Pemo Triassic and Jurassic. So, what I need you to take home with you is that we have oil potentiality with abundant generation. So is the oil. Why are we only having gas? That is the questions we need to ask ourselves. Because there might be several reasons. Does it all oil seep to the surface? Because we have several oil seeps, as the one you see at your left side, top up left side. We have abundance of oil seeps in Tanzanian side and in Mozambique side. But all of this shows that oil were generated in Ruvuma Basin. Where is it? All seeped out? Oh, all they were generated few? Oh, is it all overcooked to gas? Because there's an evidence of the uh, volcanic bodies in Ruvuma Basin. Not only in Ruvuma Basin, as you go up to the north, where there is a Rufiji Basin, you find we have these uh, hot springs in Roy, uh, Roy River in Rufiji Basin. So all of this tells us there were an, um, contributions of more uh, temperature that uh, thermally matured these already generated oil into gas, though still it was not proven. So what we should take home with us is, um, as um, researchers or scientists, even exploration companies, that Tanzania, including Ruvuma Basin, it has the potentiality for oil. If you invest, put enough energy on it, we might be able to find oil accumulation somewhere. Apart from that, uh, it calls for studies more in migration pathways like uh, doing source to oil correlation because we have an evidence of seeps and we have the source rocks. If we try to correlate the oil seeps with the source rock, maybe we might be able to pinpoint where these oil were generated. So, as, uh, as a result of all of this also, there is a need to understand the thermal evolution models of the East Africa systems. Like um, we know in Cenozoic we had this an effect of volcanism happened. So we need to understand how much temperature was this uh, source rock was subjected into. Is One it minute, still taking place? Is it still active? So that's all we need to ask ourselves. All in all, Ruvuma Basin shows oil potentiality. You are all welcome to invest. You are all, all welcome to find oil. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rachel. Thank you very much. Uh, Rachel, Rachel, she's just gotten a job with Tanzania Petroleum Development Corporation so that we can go and uh, discover the oil in Ruvuma. Permanent Secretary is, is looking at you very well, so please. <laughs> uh, this is the end of our session. Uh, if you have two questions from you to them, please. We are running out of time. We are rushing to dinner party at Spike. Two questions only, please.
Next question, please. Okay. Thank you. Um, two questions, but I'll be brief. One is to Emmanuel. On the you mentioned about the low signal to noise ratio in the seismic data set. But we have not, I think I have not seen myself, the reasons that could have caused that. Was it squarely the parameters for acquisition or something else? I'd like to hear you on that. Next one, to Rachel. Um, what you have presented for Ruvuma Basin is similar to the Ugandan story, I think. Our first modern well in the Semriki Basin encountered carbon dioxide. And a lot of circles were saying, well, this is the story for Uganda, and there isn't much potential. But when we see the work you're doing, you're looking at the different plays. I think you have identified that. That's very interesting. You look at migration pathways. We'd like to see where the existing discovery wells for the gas fields are in relation to the petroleum systems that you have identified in the basin. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Let's start uh, with Simon, please. Okay, thank you for the question. Maybe what I can say is that the volumetric analysis was not part of this study, but the, what I can comment through other studies that we have conducted in TPDC, it shows that the, the potential areas has got at approximate 682 BC of, of gas. That is, thank you. Thank you, Simon. Let's go to Emmanuel. Emmanuel, your question on signal to noise ratio. What are the reasons, please? Yeah, thank you very much for that question. I can say that uh, according to the studies so far which have been done in that area, we have uh, low velocity layers. Uh, these are basically young sediments. We find that they, they do absorb, let me use the word absorbing. Uh, if the energy is produced at the top or the seismic waves, they absorb by the time the energy travels down, it has already, let me use in the layman's language, weakened, whereby it cannot reach the target we want. So basically low velocity layers, that's one of the studies which have been done. I couldn't uh, exhaust each and everything because of that time. Yeah, but that is the reason. Thank you, Emmanuel. The last one is Rachel. Please say to say. Okay, as I said, uh, based on my study, I identified four petroleum systems, which were the Pemo Triassic system, uh, Cretaceous system, Jurassic system, and the Sonozoic, which is the youngest. And for this, the youngest, they've shown uh, discoveries, including the um, Nazi Bay gas field. It's in the Cenozoic price system. But uh, in Cretaceous place system, it's in Tolia gas field. This is where it's found in Cretaceous. But for the Pemotrasic in Jurassic, we, are, we have not yet discovered anything. So maybe in the future. But based on a time event chart map and a geological evolutions, we see that most of these older reservoirs might have been breached and charging these younger reservoirs. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you, presenters. Let's give hands to these guys. Thank you very much, guys. I think we're going to have a group photo, and then we we'll, we we'll go to our next session. All right, thank you very much. I think you can uh, clap for them one more time. Uh, but clap for yourselves as well for being an awesome audience. 
and thank you for moderating very well. Just to guide us on what's happening after this, uh, you're welcome to uh, a tea break. Uh, however, our dinner is off-site. We'll be going to the Speak Resort Munyonyo. And so at 6 o'clock sharp, we'll have, which is in about 10 or so minutes, we'll have uh, transportation available. For those who don't have transport, we have buses uh, that will pick you from here and bring you back here after the dinner. We plan to leave at 6. The dinner will be from 7 to 9 p.m. If you'd like to use your personal means, uh, you're welcome to do so. But we'll have buses available to take you. So for now, uh, the break tree is upstairs. Uh, you can also use the same time to uh, go through the posters that we have up there as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let's meet at dinner.